Thank you for joining us tonight. We're joined um, by uh, a visual artist, Siona Benjamin, who explores kind of the cross sections between personal identity and um, art, creative arts. It's like Siona's work is fascinating. Um, she has such a unique voice and I hope you really um, enjoy not just her personal story, but her artistic story as, as much as, as we do. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, our BRM weekly series still continues in full swing. We are virtual uh, once a week. Our um, series has reached over 25,000 audience members in our community, and we're just so thankful for all the support um, from everyone who attends our weekly sessions and who watches the streams once they've gone up. So thank you so much for your support. We are also um, have a really exciting program upcoming that explores gender power and the performing arts when it comes to South Asian arts and culture. That's May 14th through June 29th. So please visit our website that I will post in the chat to find out more about um, this program and the other weeklies we have coming up. Also wanted to just take a moment to think of our families, friends, and our loved ones in India. They're experiencing some deep uh, challenges there um, in regards to the pandemic. And if you're interested in donating and supporting efforts over there, you can go to covid.giveindia.org. I will also put that in the chat. So without further ado, I'm going to thank you. I'll be posting some comments in the chat just to get us started while Siona kind of walks us through her artistic journey. And Siona Benjamin, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David, for inviting. And um, it's a pleasure to be at uh, Brooklyn, um, you know, Raga Massive. <clears throat> it's a very impressive venue. Um, I've known about it for a while and I know your music. It's fabulous. Everything is fabulous. So it's great that you're inviting visual artists too. Um, well, um, I wanted to start off by uh, talking a little bit about my background. Um, I am from India and like David said, I'm proudly Indian. It's really sad what's going on in India right now. Uh, I don't have much family left there. Very, very few, uh, just a few cousins. Most of my family, um, Indian Jew, mostly Indian Jews have immigrated to Israel and to the US, but mostly to Israel. Um, but I do go to India as often as I can. I've had a Fulbright over there and I'll share some of that work over here too. So um, I am a Bene Israel Jew from India. My family gradually dispersed mostly to Israel and America, but my parents remained in India. I am also now an American living and working in New Jersey, but I still recall the ornate synagogues of my childhood, the oil lamps, the velvet and silver covered Torahs, a chair left vacant for the prophet Elijah in our Bombay synagogues. Having grown up in a predominantly Hindu Muslim society, being educated in Catholic and Zoroastrian schools, being raised Jewish in India and now living in America, I have always had to reflect on the cultural boundary zones in which I have lived. So therefore in my paintings, I combine both the imagery of my past with the role I play in America today. Um, and I just wanted to share a few pictures about Jewish India from my background. This is the Magin David Synagogue in Mumbai. This is the famous uh, Cochin Pardesi Synagogue built in the you know, 1400s <clears throat> in, um, in South India in Cochin. Um, it has tiles from China and it has, uh, it's been very well maintained and one of India's very um, cherished monuments that has been maintained in South India. Some of the other synagogues around that area have unfortunately deteriorated, but this synagogue unfortunately has been very well maintained. This is uh, this picture is taken during my Fulbright trip to India in 2011. And then just to show you a few pictures of Jewish India, I have a lot of them. Um, and I have a book coming out, which I will show you about, uh, show you some, some of that, you know, that, that book about, you know, in, in about a few slides. Um, New Year's Day in Magin Hasidim Synagogue. Uh, it's a, one of the synagogues that I frequently went to as a child. My grandmother lived across from this synagogue 
in central Mumbai. And so I would go to her home and, you know, have the festivities there and then go to the synagogue across the street to the Magin Hasidim synagogue. Just a glimpse of like what Indian Jewish family, this is one of my, part of my family. This is my mother's sister's family, actually. The entire family went to Israel, immigrated to Israel in the 60s and is still there. Um, my mother's sister is with the baby on her lap and uh, she lives in Naharia in Israel currently and she's in her 80s. This is an example of some of the many, many photographs I have of which uh, will be shown in this book. This is the henna ceremony of in an Indian Jewish wedding ceremony. And uh, henna, it doesn't sound Jewish, but it's not, you know, it's not an Ashkenazi Jewish tradition, but it is very much a Middle Eastern and Indian and Moroccan and even Ethiopian tradition of using henna as part of the ceremony. So the Jews in the non-Western world um, have rituals like this, one of the many rituals. This is uh, the hands of an Indian Jewish bride <clears throat> with a henna on her hands. Um, another picture from my family album, my parents from the 19, from 1950 on their wedding day. If you notice the, <clears throat> the wonderful melange of, of uh, mixture of, uh, you know, iconography, my mother is wearing a white sari with Indian, very Indian jewelry with gloves, with probably henna under the gloves, um, you know, so they had a mix of this sort of, uh, um, in their clothing, in their, in their food, um, they kept kosher by using a lot of coconut products in their food, so you didn't mix milk and meat. Um, and there are lots of special prayers, um, melodies, food, and um, very special culture that came from Jewish India, which I will be talking about in this book. I'm doing a, <clears throat> I've done a book with uh, Professor Ori Soltis from Georgetown University. And this is gonna be released very soon. There's some pandemic delays, um, which are delaying it for a, a few weeks or maybe a month, but it should be out very soon. And it's called Growing Up Jewish in India, Synagogues, Customs and Communities from the Bene Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. So we've talked about the different communities, different um, scholars have talked about the different communities. And then we've <clears throat> uh, already talked about my work and how I am influenced by uh, my Indian Jewishness, by my Americanness, by my transculturalness. So um, I am inspired by both Indian Persian miniature paintings, which are very old paintings from the Mughal court and from the Hindu kings from centuries ago. But I'm also like this example over here that you see, but I'm also inspired by illuminated manuscripts, both Christian and Jewish. And this is an example from Catalonia, Spain, the gold leaf, the you know the the technique of painting which comes from uh, from a very special technique using sometimes egg tempera sometimes using very um, you know uh, different kinds of paints which are made very organically. So, I am therefore a transcultural artist. I believe that transculturalism will help in artistic and other ways to be a bridge between the traditional and the modern. This bridging not only affects recent immigrants of this country, but also Americans that have lived here for many generations. So people can learn new ways to, commu to communicate and have artistic discourse with each other. So you ask, what is a transcultural person? A transcultural per person is rather like a chameleon, I feel, being able to change his or her colors according to the situation and environment. Today's world politics pushes and promotes a need for a sense of belonging a push to take sides, either black or white. The gray scale in between needs to be explored so that when one makes final evaluations, it is painted with a fairness that allows us to learn about all perspectives and points of view. Um, so my work kind of pushes, talks about this transculturalness. It explores the immigrant cultures, the uniqueness of identity, of um, motherhood, of feminism, all of the above. And, um, I have been trained in, I have an MFA in, in painting and art history, but I also have an MFA in theater set design. 
And this is an example of a rendering of one of my set designs. Uh, I did an opera called Rigoletto. That's the actual set. So um, this, this training in theater set design really opened up many new ways of thinking, of learning how to recycle mythology, how to um, read a play and then build a set that reflected the emotions of that play. And then I went on later on to also learn Midrash with a rabbi, and that reflected the same kind of philosophy where you read a text and then you kind of reinterpret it to create your own story, to use that as a jumping board, to be able to talk about, it's kind of like in music terms, it's like improvisation. You take from the old and then you improvise to create something new. And that is what you call your own and you make your own by changing it enough so that it becomes and gives it a new identity. So this is a few examples of my older work. Um, this is an example of actually not my work, a uh, Mughal miniature painting from 1760. A woman is sitting in a landscape, you know, smoking hookah. It's an idyllic scene. So taking inspiration from that, for example, finding on number 28, a figure myself in blue jeans is seated in a traditional miniature landscape is sipping coke through a long straw, which suggests a hookah. I'm imbibing the intoxicating American elixir poison Coca-Cola, symbolizing the layer of the West, which draws me to reside in the US. In the background, the house says Ima in Hebrew and represents the home I was leaving when I immigrated to the US. There's a demon on top of the painting with a gun and a nuclear weapon suggesting that war will infiltrate and further disrupt the scene. So this is a few of the few, few things, just a few things happening in this painting. There's a lot more, but just to highlight it. Here's another example. It's called Zakham or Finding Omer 56 is inspired from the page in the Quran, but also from Jewish illuminated manuscripts. Are the swords a weapon that will descend on her? or are they a protection against unforeseen dangers? What seems like Urdu or Arabic writing above actually spells out it's unfortunate in English. So I like to kind of fool my viewers by making it look like Arabic or Urdu or whatever, and it's actually just English. Or I take, I write something in Hebrew and it, and it pronounced, when you read it, it pronounces something in, 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 in English or vice versa. Um, so uh, this painting is kind of, um, this is the bottom half of it. There's the Shama in the center, like a protective mandala. I'm, um, a character is sleeping at the bottom. Her sari becomes, feeds the roots of the plants. And um, I've done this in the form of a traditional miniature painting with um, the border kind of unequal on either side. And inspired by this Mughal miniature painting where a king is holding a globe, his hand is on his sword, probably King Akbar or King Aurangzeb, I forget which one, it's, um, it's one of the typical Mughal miniature portraits. So I have inspired by those kind of single portraits, I have done finding on number 45, sister is done in response to the Middle East crisis half Jewish and half Muslim, both her hands display the rich henna of their similarities. They seem peaceful, yet in front of them, there's a blasting plunger and wires that indicate a bomb connected to them, as you can see at the bottom of the painting. Will they destroy themselves or is there any hope that they will be saved from themselves? So the similarities are there. I grew up very closely with Muslims and Hindus and all different communities. And then I don't understand the strife between Jew and Muslim, for example. And so they are joined here in the middle displaying their similarities, but at the same time, um, there's danger lurking at the bottom. And then I did a series of paintings, which is called Farishte, which in Urdu, I explore the women of the Torah and bring them forward to combat wars and violence of today in a midrash or interpretation of intricate paintings. It is through all this that I can dip into my own personal specifics and universalize, thus playing the role of an artist activist. We have limited time, and so I will skip reading on this particular painting, but I will go to the next one in the series, which um, is equally exciting to present. It's finding on number 34, uh, 74, sorry, it's called Lilith. I did a lot of paintings based on the character Lilith. So who is Lilith? 
Based on the Jewish Midrashic legends, Lilith is the first Eve who was created at the same time as Adam. She was unwilling to forego her equality with Adam. Rebuffed, she took her case to God, who responded to her seductive powers by revealing his divine name. She earned her ticket out of paradise and into eternal exile. Thus, Lilith has been called the demoness and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Lilith made a return in feminist history as an example of female strength and mystery. So here she is in greater detail. She says, a thousand years have I waited, keeping the embers of revenge. So she is any woman asking for revenge, whether she is Palestinian or whether she's Israeli or whether she's um, in Africa or whether she's a woman wronged or you know, in, in any kind of situation, she is come back and she asks difficult questions. So also inspired by Roy Lichtenstein, the famous pop artist, uh, American pop artist, combined with the drama of Indian Amar Chitra Katha comics um, and Bollywood, which I grew up with, surrounded by in Mumbai when I was growing up. My mother ran a, a school and many of the Bollywood kids would come to her private school. All these serve as an inspiration for my Lilith series. Indian Persian miniature paintings and illuminated manuscripts also creep into parts of the painting style. The blonde heroine in Lichtenstein's paintings has been cast, has been recast as a blue maiden. So here uh, is another Lilith painting where she says, you must save us from their wrath. So who is us and who is them? That border is not clear. That definition is not defined over here. So us and them, is always something that separates us, but as us and them is what she is pointing out over here that you know she should be saved from. And um, in conclusion, I wanna say that often I look down at my skin and it has turned blue. It tends to do that when I face certain situations of people stereotyping and categorizing other people who are unlike themselves. I have therefore over the years developed many blue skin characters in my paintings. I also uh, work with dancers, as you can see here, and you will see a few snippets of my dance and music. I'm very inspired by South Asian hybrid classical, you know, music uh, that is inspired by Indian music, but is recreated and improvised to create new music. So I use a lot of that music to work with, and I work with several dancers. This blue portrait of uh, self-portrait of sorts takes on many roles and forms through which I can theatrically explore ancient and contemporary dilemmas. In this process of recycling and rejuvenating, they merely remind us of making the work and hopefully my audience in viewing the work that myth making is cyclical and timeless. Thus the blue skin for me has become a symbol of being a Jewish woman of color, of being the other, of being, of being asked, repeatedly, how come there are Jews in India? Well, I say, well, they've been there for 2000 years. So having to explain that repeatedly, I sort of slowly turned blue. Um, I also want to take you through a few of my recent projects where I not only do these paintings and I sell them and I have agents and galleries or whatever that represent me, but I also do a lot of some commercial work like this. Uh, I've done seven six foot artworks for a Marriott boutique hotel last year and the year before that actually. Here's one of them in the lobby. I've also worked with synagogues and I um, am known for that blue color so it comes out in many other forms. This is a parochet or a Torah art curtain and an amud or a table cover for uh, a synagogue in Pennsylvania. Uh, Ohev Shalom, and I'm currently doing another project for them. Um, I also do work in many different mediums, like, uh, for example, this is a floor done for a synagogue, CRC synagogue in St. Louis, which is done in, in porcelain tiles. So my artwork was converted into porcelain tiles. Um, this also, I would wanted to highlight, um, like, how does an artist make a living? How does, how do you, um, continue to do what you love to do without being compromised. So this is what I do a lot. I do a lot of commercial projects, but I'm very often invited to do the projects, bringing in my 
my style or my blueness or what I represent nowadays. Here's another project I did at Megillat Esther for a private gallery in New York City. And this um, is a scroll painting, which is 15 feet long by one foot wide. And um, again, the, uh, the main characters um, were from the story of the Megillat Esther, but I illuminated it in Persian Indian miniature style, as you see here. I also do private commissions, uh, very often working with interior designers to um, sometimes have to match the color scheme of the, uh, of, the, of the place that I'm working in. Like in this, I had to bring, in, bring out a lot of browns and oranges. And uh, so I do some private projects too, like this. I also built, also have designed furniture like this Torah Ark for a commission in the Bronx in uh, at a SAR Jewish Day School in the Bronx. Uh, it's all gold leafed and uh, 22 karat gold leaf and um, it's made of, uh, it's all made of wood. So uh, another most recent commission I just finished is um, I finished doing a children's book illustration for a book which is called I Am Hava. Uh, it should be, this children's book should be coming out in, by September, October this year. And so uh, this is my first children's book. I'll be doing another one sometime soon. So it was very interesting to do something totally different and um, get into the story, you know, that way by illustrating for children. Very amazing experience. Uh, besides doing the commercial projects, I also, um, I feel, I feel it necessary to have my work available, not just to people who can afford expensive paintings, but so I've converted my work into silk shawls and yoga mats. And so this way the art is accessible at a much cheaper price to people. The imagery is accessible to be worn or to be hung in, in different fashions. So uh, here's one of my yoga mats that I also have. So I have a separate website that I do I make merchandise out of some of my art. So this gives you an idea as to how an artist makes a living or tries to make a living. Um, I wanna go on to talking a little bit about my Fulbright project in India really quickly. My first Fulbright was in 2011 and I conducted research and interviews with Jews in India resulting in a collection of 40 photo collage paintings titled Faces Weaving Indian Jewish Narratives. These work continue to travel in museums and galleries. And um, this um, part of this, this project was also made into a documentary film, which is called Blue Like Me, which is available now on Amazon Prime. So what I pretty much did is I took photographs of people, of the different people in my community in Mumbai. I positioned them in a certain way. And then I did photo collage paintings. So I photo collaged them on the computer, had them printed on three by three feet photo paper. And then I painted on top of those. Uh, to create, to tell the story of each, each of these families or individuals that spoke to me. I videoed them, I photographed them, and I wanted to document some of their stories and highlight. I asked them key questions about their Jewishness in India. And so based on that, I did these photo collage paintings. Here's another example, my mother, um, who I photographed and I did a triptych actually as a tribute to her, my daughter and me and my mother her hair sort of tying us together and weaving these stories uh, from, from my childhood. My, at the bottom and the top, there's my great, great grandparents and my grandparents and all in collaged in there. So here's an example as to how I did the photo collage. So here's a photograph of Daniel Elijah Benjamin Gutger from Pune. His face was very amazing you know, very like almost like a face that could be on a, on a coin. So I actually cut it out on the computer, just like that. And then I placed it in the photo collage of the synagogue that he used to pray in ev almost every day in Pune, which is, um, you know, a few miles away from Mumbai. It's a beautiful couple of synagogues there. Um, and then we, uh, this is my student intern learning how to gold leaf. And this is the final result. So I did, um, again, the photo collage painting, telling his story and the prayer he was saying. And um, then it was also accompanied by video and by the documentary that was made about some of the characters here. Here's another example um, out of many 
40 pieces, 42 pieces that I made, an Indian Jewish bride, her henna ceremony, um, which I photographed, and then <clears throat> the design layout for the final piece. And then here is the final photo collage painting. So uh, from this photo collage, which was just printed on photo paper, I then painted on top of it to tell her story. Um, there's many different, her husband's tadid is over her head. You know, she liked to paint in this certain kind of style, which is called warly painting. So I highlighted that, told some of her story in that. And while I was doing this painting, I, which was about a year or so later, um, she was already married when I, when I did meet her. She was um, going to have a baby. So I kind of showed that a little bit in the painting to win the story of, um, of this Indian Jewish bride. This is my second project. My second Fulbright was From Motherland to Fatherland, Transcultural Indian Jews in Israel. So this is a Indian Jewish synagogue in Israel, in Beersheba, Israel. Um, I have a lot of family in Israel, so I got a chance to really um, meet a lot of people, um, family-wise and otherwise. I completed my second United States Israel Fulbright Fellowship to extend the current transcultural identity dialogue on Indian Jews in Israel. So what I was gonna do over here is um, I took photographs of different generations. Here's a grandmother, a Cucini grandmother with her granddaughter who's part Bene Israel, part Cochini and part Ashkenazi. Um, for example, just taking different generations. He has a father and a son. Uh, the father is Bene Israel, the son is, uh, he's a cousin of mine and the son is half Bene Israel and half Cochini Jew. Um, here is another example, another cousin of mine who married a Yemenite Jew. So here are two of his five daughters. So they're half Bene Israel and half Yemenite. Um, so just observing, talking to them, finding out how they preserve their Indian Jewishness or not, or how they have hybridized it. It was very, very interesting to me in this Fulbright. Here's another Indian Jewish friend of mine in Israel and she married a Romanian Jew and that's her daughter. Uh, Zohar. So I plan to, and here's, I think, one more. Here's a father and son. Um, so I, what I plan to do is I have done a few of them. And as I write, write more grants, I'm going to do even more because they're kind of expensive to make. So I'm going to do 3D lenticular prints where um, actually the overlapping of the two generations then um, will show the two generations by you just walking by the photograph or by changing the photograph in your hand. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. It's been a few years, but I'm slowly making as many as I can because like I said, they're two by three feet and lenticular prints are pretty expensive to make. So um, last of all, I wanna share with you my most recent work that I just finished about a couple of weeks ago. It's titled Amistad, a slave ship for a new century. It is a mixed media, 22 karat gold leaf on wood panel. I made a boat like triptych, inspired by the medieval European retabla like structures, which open up to display Judeo Christian themes. I combined that with the idea of a boat, the slave ship, carrying numerous refugees, hopefully into safety from their countries and dictators of persecution. Many blue men uh, sit packed in the golden boat, huddled, motionless, scared, yet hopeful. Lilith, who is Kali, who is also Medusa, always blamed for her cries of mercy and justice. Is this the moral and human condition of our era? The letter Shin, which is Shaddai, one of the many names of God and equivalent to the number 300 in the Hebrew alphabet represents divine power and potential peace. So um, this piece is still with the framer is being fixed and, um, you know, but it's, uh, this is a, the full view of the full triptych. Um, so I wanted to show the yin and yang actually the, you know, she's actually balancing an angel, but at the same time, she's cutting the rope of another angel that's trying to climb up. Um, and the, the boat like effect, I looked at the uh, Amistad slave ship actual drawings that I found and I found that the way the men were packed, the people were packed in there. I tried to imitate that in this sort of uh, boat-like shape, which is uh, closes like a retabla. So this is my one of my most recent works that besides doing the commercial 
the um, you know the the commissions. I'm doing three commissions right now. Um, one is a uh, tiles for a swimming pool. Uh, another one is a scroll for telling the story of a lost scrolls from Czechoslovakia during the Holocaust. All right. The other one is also a uh, uh, a, um, a ketubah for a couple. So I do various different kinds of uh, commissions like that. Thank you so much for your attention. And I think I'll hand it over to David so that he can show a few snippets of the video. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a lot to digest, um, Fiona. I think before we go to the videos, if um, you want to just stop sharing your screen, if you have sure. it already, um, just a technical request. Thank you. And I, a lot of things came to mind you know, I just want to, again, encourage everyone who's here viewing. I know it's a late hour and, you know, you're just a, an observer. But yes, um, I, I agree, Manda Lynn, that scroll is definitely, um, yeah, it's like you just snuck this scroll project in and then moved on and pretended that none of us would notice the, the depth and the breadth of that project. That's pretty impressive. But I was, I was thinking about how you know, very rare, you know, we talk about, you know, India, Indians in the di in the diaspora and the African American experience in the diaspora and in the Caribbean. And I, I think it's really valuable to see, um, well, just to, to have you share with us your personal experience, because when we think about diaspora and, and roots, we often don't necessarily talk about we don't we don't think oh Jewish and South Asian and American we don't really put those together in in combination with one another so it's really interesting to hear how um, your story although different is really more of a shared narrative that you know we see throughout the throughout the country and in, in the United States and North America in general um, is that some I I know in your work it seems to think it seems to me that you know. Um, migration, immigration, diaspora, the story of the refugee seems to be these narratives that kind of play, that you play with in, in your work. Would that be um, accurate kind of to, to say? Yes, um, I think uh, my work is kind of about, like I said, about identity and immigration. And um, I think, um, you know, uh, it's repeatedly brought up um, you know, sometimes, you know, always the question is where are you from? Where, where are you from? <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell. It could be anything from South American to Southern Italian to Pakistani to whatever, Iranian. So, <clears throat> so then when I say I'm only from India, it's, um, you know, it's maybe sometimes okay, but sometimes I kind of want to specify and say I'm a Jew from India. And so there's a whole bucket load of questions that open up, which is fine. I can understand and I'm happy to answer them. And so I think making my work, it's also kind of about, you know, sort of an education to for people to understand the true diversity of what our world has to offer. You know, I mean, there is no pure race. There is um, there's no compartment compartmentalizing of people that somebody has to look a certain way to come from a certain place or so it's sort of, um, you know, my work has sort of become also kind of about that and the blue skin characters help me to uh, further that story, that cause, and it's fun. I mean, it's, it's fun and it's also, I feel like um, I have my little, I have my, my story to tell, my mythologies that kind of recycle and rejuvenate. And um, it's like Midrash, it's like a bottomless well, I haven't, even scratch the surface, I feel. And so, you know, it's exciting to be able to feel that as of now. Um, so that's, that's what I... I think in getting to know you, you know, as we have just, you know, recently, although we've known, I've known about you and known about your work for many years, I think, you know, you know, you see that when when artists or creators become their work and their work becomes them, it starts to be like you can't really you can't really take one away from the other or separate one from the other. And I feel that way about you a lot. You are the embodiment of your work and looking at your work, it, it's 
it's almost very almost easy for me to know who the person is by that work too so i think there's a lot of fun um interplay there um i was also you know in in i i love i love the being able to highlight the relationship between you know judaism jewishness jew with with indian music with india indian backgrounds indian arts south asian arts there, there's I, I love the fact that we can kind of explore that relationship here. And blue is 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 a really significant significant color in South Asian arts, as is gold. And you know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but the the um, the holy shawl in Judaism is the tzitzit, which men are often seen wearing. It's like a a, a cloth garment, and there are these strings that hang off at the end, and with certain significance. But you know, originally one of those one of those strands at the bottom of the tzitzit is supposed to be dyed blue which comes from a which comes from like a certain cuttlefish or octopus of ancient name and i thought i that kind of stood out to me too how this color connection between you know jewish and like hindu um blue is was like connected in that way right exactly so i think uh, many people tell me oh is that the krishna blue and i say yeah it is partly i grew up surrounded by these idols and icons but it's also the blue of the tzitzit and the blue in the talit and uh you know the blue of ancient pottery in so many different places like in jaipur or you know, in, I don't know, in certain parts of Spain. So I think that the blue, but also most importantly, the blue is the color of the sky and the ocean. And I feel that that blue, that turquoise blue kind of made me feel like I belong everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, sometimes I feel I belong nowhere and I feel like a little bit orphaned, like I feel you know, my family is so spread out and where am I from and where do I really fit in and who is my community, so to speak. And then sometimes I feel, oh, I fit into so many different categories that, you know, I can just like a chameleon sort of mold myself when I go to the next community and just feel comfortable there. And sometimes I would just momentarily in that community feel suddenly alienated because I feel this something didn't make me feel like I belong, but then I feel drawn back in again. So it's just that kind of like schizophrenic sort of uh, in and out of, you know, feeling that is, um, is unnerving, but at the same time, I feel it is, um, it is, I feel a lot of people feel that. Like I've come to, so many people have come up and told me, you know, and they could be having large families around them and they could feel like different, so to speak, or they don't feel like they fit in. And so they feel like they are the outsider or the other and they think differently or whatever the reason is. So I feel that that kind of identification is um, very crucial and very expansive, you know, like the universe, it can just yeah, yeah it can just go on forever and you know and the, the the theme and the concept of the border of where in the per in our personal psyche where we put borders for ourselves and how we limit or define ourselves into feeling um, a part of or excluded from communities as we define them and also talking about borders when you're talking about again like immigration and refugees the physical geographic borders um and religious borders. And I think the theme of, of, of borders is so poignant in the work that you present. And I think what unifies the, the variety and diverse viewers and audiences of your work is that um, you are of so much, you are of so much and of nothing at all at the same time as you self or as you, you know, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but in po no, poetic terms. And um, as we all are, we are all just, we are, but we are also nothing. And I, I really enjoy that. What we do share in common is this sense of um, ancient texts to draw from. As we know, the Jewish community is very keen on Talmud and Midrash and Torah. And, you know, um, with Islam, it's, it's the Quran, which is, you know, which is looked to as a cornerstone for how we live our lives. And 
Hinduism, we have the Ved the Vedas and, and Sanskrit chants. So I, I, I love the fact that you are playing with all of these various what we what would be seen what would seem as um, dissimilar or different, but actually they're all in of the same. So I think that's really something really beautiful about about the work as well. Mm -hmm. It's like um, it's like the the Big Bang or something like it's it's expansive, but it's kind of collide it co it kind of collapses into a, into into nothing or a dot, you know. So you can expand, but at the same time you can just sort of just. Uh, come together as one in a way. Um, it's very interesting that like it's almost a, like a scientific sort of feeling that you, that feeling of belonging and then not, never belonging. And um, um, it's, um, it's, that's what I try to show in my work as much as, as much as I can. No. Um, and um, never wanting to take sides or even though I might have a certain viewpoint, but trying to detach myself from that as much as possible without being biased, I think it's really important that makes the real work happen. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, you know, being uh, an artist myself. And in the interest of time, I think what I'll do is I'll go, again, I encourage everyone, if you have any comments or questions for Siona, um, put them in the chat. I know that a lot of what you know, you're speaking about is resonating with mandolin. So thank you for, thank you for validating our conversation and our exchange here. Um, and we're just going to play just to, you know, cue up these videos. We're just going to take about 20 to 30 um, second snippets of three videos. We'll just go one at a time. And then Siona will go ahead and put these into context for us um, right after we view them. So if I could just have everyone's patience and kindness while I queue up these videos. Um, I'll be right with you. So that is just a, a few short um, clips from a few videos. And um, it's interesting to kind of see how your vision and your work manifest to 
the you know choreography and live music and yeah can you tell us a little bit about what we just watched sure so um many years ago i was uh, uh maybe in the mid 2000s i always used to think like i would love to paint actual bodies blue and like have them dance act dance out parts of my paintings sometimes with the paintings projected behind them sometimes in gallery museum on stage settings like you saw over here the different one is in israel at a gallery at my my at my opening at the at the at a space in um, in israel and tel aviv and uh, another one was at a at a museum um, in the united states another one is at the jerusalem biennale so i, I collaborated with many different dancers and uh, one of my oldest not old in age but like she's been wor working with me for many years dina dennis She's actually, I just was talking to her today and I said, can you join us for a few minutes at the end? And so um, the process is about, she's here, um, Dina wants to turn her camera on. She's, I don't know if she's still, if she's there. There she is, yes. Hi, Dina. <laughs> so she's one of my dancers that I've collaborated almost the, the longest with. And uh, what we do is I'll let Dina also explain a little bit where we look at a painting and then Dina, you know, talks to me about it and we discuss it in great depth. And I'll let Dina talk a little bit more about the dance process as to how you interpret the moves as to what the story is. Dina? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, so, well, Siona's work is, is just really rich. I mean, there's just so much to pull from, from the images of the main characters to the pictures that are embedded behind the characters, within the characters. So, you know, uh, when Siona first comes to me and starts talking to me about a performance or a show she'd like to do, we, we start looking at the work together and we start thinking about okay, what is the story first of all? And now what do we see happening? So we look at the images. I come with a ton of questions for her um, because I'm so curious, one. And two, the more I learn, the more I'm able to give to the work. And not only that, but Siona also provides poetry often. She talked a little about it tonight where she has descriptions of the work and often short poems and, and um, texts that draw back to the religious text. So it's really nice because it gives it a narrative to work with. So then we create a storyline uh, within the piece using all of these images. And then I'm able to create larger movements as well as a lot of gestural movements that um, really tell the story of the work and embody the work the best I can. But um, yeah, it, it's just such a wonderful process. It sends a lot of back and forth of our discussions and how does this look and does this really make sense? And, and is this telling the story? Is it giving the sense of the feeling that we're trying to um, get across to the audience? So that, that's pretty much how we work. It's a very ongoing collaborative process and um, a lot of fun, a lot of digging and a lot of discovery. Right. And uh, Dina is kind of like my muse a little bit. You know, she allows me to paint her. And uh, what is really fun is that the dialogue more, you know, the result is always nice. The performance is always great. But like we, we really dissect the painting. We talk about every part of it, what that means. And then she will tell me in with what gestures dance wise she interprets that. So if it is about anger or if it is about if it is about love, like how will she show it with, with the dance? And so it becomes this abstract dance movement, but there is meaning behind it because it is taken from a story, from a narrative story, which comes from my painting. And so I feel like Dina is this blue character come alive from my work. And it's kind of like a dream come true for me. I always thought about it. And then now I have worked with several dancers, but Dina is one of my main dancers. She's also a professional dancer in New York City. She is uh, the... The, uh, the head of this organization, this uh, dance company called Dance Into Light. So she does many performances. And so, you know, she's a full-time professional dancer. And so it's great for me to work with someone like that. Who had a, who, and Dina just had a new baby. She who was asleep. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you, Siona. And thank you for the opportunity to work with you. I think just one other thing I want to mention is, um, 
we fuse because you talk a lot about the fusion and the transculturalism and, and that's what happens with the dance because I'm a classically trained modern and ballet dancer. I've also studied a little bit of Kathak dance and then looking at the mudras and the use of the Indian mudras in dance. And we fuse all of this together to help tell the stories. So our the dance becomes a sense of transculturalism as well. But thanks, Siona. Thank you, Dina. <laughs> like I said, she's my muse. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to see um, the, you know, the partnership and collaboration across different um, mediums and artistic mediums. It's 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 really a rewarding experience and helps um, the audience really immerse themselves and come into relationship with with the work uh, where he, she or they otherwise I wouldn't. Um, thank you. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, gearing up towards the end of end of our session, but I was just wondering, um, Siona, what is life like for you, you know, these days and recently since, you know, we've been in quarantine because of the pandemic these last this last year, but especially now that the, um, the last few months, you know, people um, around you know in our, our area are, are becoming vaccinated things seem to be opening up is is there a shift happening for you uh, personally and artistically right now um what i'm really missing is the actual you know going to the venues to give my i do a lot of part of my living i also give artists artist talks and do artist residencies and you know um, scholar and residences and whatnot quite a lot and i get to travel because of that that is something that I really missed, like meeting people and, you know, shaking hands with people, like going out to dinner after that, you know, like just kind of socializing with people is something I really missed. But thank goodness for these kind of, uh, you know, Zoom presentations, which I've done a ton of this last year. Um, most of my work is kind of solitary where I have to get a commission and kind of work on it myself. But so I'm used to kind of being in my studio, which this is what it is. Um, but I think um, I really have missed, uh, you know, exhibitions, exhibiting, going to openings and stuff like that. But, you know, this is the state of the world. And I think, um, you know, just thinking about what's happening in India, um, I just got vaccinated fully and I feel so lucky to have had that opportunity. And um, when I look at what's happening in India right now, it is extremely sad that, you know, it just feels so helpless about how do you help these millions of people who have uh, don't even have oxygen or a hospital to go to. And so um, it's been a sad year. And uh, but work wise for me, I think it's been a really productive year. Uh, I've been able to concentrate on doing my own work, but also I've been I think people have been really those people who are patrons of the art have actually just come way out to kind of uh, give commissions to artists like me. So I've been really busy the last couple of years, lots of commissions, and I still continue to have them, thank goodness. Um, only thing I'm missing is actually physically meeting people, <laughs> yeah. you know, as we all are. Yeah, um, yeah, so true, so true. Um, great, so that kind of wraps up our session for tonight. I can't thank you enough, Siona, for agreeing to um, join us for our Tuesday weekly sessions. I want to thank everybody who joined on YouTube, and I want to thank everybody who will be watching this after it gets posted in the days to come for, for joining us and learning a little bit more about Siona. It's been so great to hear your story and share your story. Um, and please visit uh, Brooklyn Raga Massive's website to find out more about our future events. Um, find out how you can help um, and participate and contribute to this community of musicians, artists, thinkers, philosophers, creative makers. And we look forward to seeing everybody next time. So thank you and have a really, really good night. Thank you, David. Thank you for your wonderful music too. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>